All right. So, hi everybody. My name is Nicole, and I am from the Vancouver Curium here at Vancouver, British Columbia. And today we have a whole exhibit with us, and we are actually at the Underwater Stellar. And I'm going to share with you a lot of knowledge about the Arctic. So I'm really happy to share my knowledge and my experience here at Vancouver, British, uh, British Columbia. And the aquarium is actually located at a traditional land of the Coast Salish people, including Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So we, of course, we know about uh, Arctic, and we want you to know more as well because they're um, a mystery for a lot of people. And some of you or some of our friends may actually live near the Arctic as well. So today we're going to dive in and try to learn about learn about um, the things that we have uh, in our planet. So before the start of the act uh, the whole activities, I want to do a warm up game with you all. So what I will do is that I will try to give you five statements and these statements are related to the Arctic. So I want you to guess if it is correct or not. So if you listen, have you, if you have listened to the statement, try to type in true or false to indicate and tell me what do you think. So are you guys ready? All right, so let's start with the first statement. So the first statement is Arctic is on the northern side of the Earth. So is it true or is it false? Ooh. Very nice. I saw a lot of truths in the comment box. That's right, Arctic is actually on the northern side of the Earth, and we call that part actually called the North Pole and its surrounding area in the Northern Hemisphere. So it leads to my second question to you all. So the statement is, we can see penguins in the Arctic. Is it true or is it false? Oh, all those comments. Some of you say true, some of you say false, right? Some of you say, I don't know. <laughs> so for the answer is that we cannot see penguins in the Arctic, but instead we can see penguins in the South Pole, which is in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the habitat or the temperature right there in both the North Pole and South Pole are similar. Just that we cannot see any penguins up north uh, because of the distribution of the animals. And but on the other hand, we can actually see other kind of Arctic animals as well. So for example, Arctic forests, or even we can see fish around, we can see killer whales, we can also see polar bears, of course, and there are different kinds of animals that scientists may not have the chance to discover as well. So good job for you guys who actually answered false. All right, this third statement that I have here is a part of Canada and part of the U.S. are within the Arctic Circle. So is it true or is it false? True, false, false. Ooh. I got some truths. Right. So for this statement, it's actually true. So for Canada and part of the US, they're actually within the Arctic Circle. So for Canada, we have Nunavut and also Northwest Territories are actually within the Arctic Circle. But how about the US? Alaska is actually the region that are within the Arctic Circle. Yeah, for example, Greenland for other country as well. Uh, Greenland is also within the Arctic Circle. Good job, everybody. And then the, four, the fourth statement that I have for you is, there are no people living in the Arctic. Is it true or is it false? Ooh. 
Excellent. So for the uh, uh, in Canada, we have a community of the indigenous people called Inuit. They are actually living near the Arctic Circle every day from thousands of years ago. And they have very, very uh, huge and rich history there. And they have a lot of uh, knowledge about how to deal with such a harsh environment and also to uh, survive in such cold weather up north as well. So we have Inuits uh, staying in the Arctic. And for a um, very nice uh, fact for you is that there are 53 community over there and Inuit in their language means people. Yeah, so we have people, we have friends actually living in the Arctic. Excellent. Right. And last question is not a true or false, but I want you to type in what do you think the Arctic look like? Is it uh, an open water area or are there trees or are there any vegetation up there? Big and wide open, icy, snowy trees in the summer. Oh, that's cool. So for Arctic, it's not completely white or icy for many of the part. But some of the part in summer, they actually have vegetation, they have bushes, or they have grass on it. And we call that part as tundra. And you can see Arctic foxes over there. You can see polar bear walking by as well. And most of the area in the Arctic Circle are white with open water. So I want to share with you my screen. Let me see if I can share my screen. Seems like I cannot share my screen, but it's all right. Um, so for the Arctic. Hold on, Nicole, I can give you host privileges. So try now. Yay, I got it. <laughs> Yay. So now you can see my screen is um, the Arctic area that we usually look at. So we have open water and also ice. Uh, floating around and usually for animals like um, polar bears and also walruses, they are actually staying on ice and also water alternatively and let me see and in that area it's really really cold it's minus 70, 70 degrees celsius up there and with such a harsh environment a lot of animals manage to survive because they have adaptations on their body structure and also their behavior. So today we're going to talk about some of the animals which have cool adaptations. So the first one that I would love to ask you about is this animal. Can you name this animal by typing your answer on the box? Luga. Seal, dolphin. Oh, most of you said this is a beluga, and that is correct. Beluga is actually an Arctic animal that indigenous people love them so much and rely on them every day. So beluga whale have a lot of body adaptation as well as their behavior in order to survive in such a cold and open area. So. I want you to think about what kind of adaptations do beluga have in order to survive in the Arctic. Yeah, they eat fish a lot, so they usually swim uh, underneath the ice and search for Arctic cord and Arctic char. Yeah. And let me see your comments. Whoa. Blubber. They need water. They need they have fish. Oh, that's all correct. So for beluga, they have a lot of adaptations. So first of all, when you take a look at the body structure here, it's white in color. 
So what they do with the white color is that they try to swim near the eyes so that the body looks like they are blending into the environment, like the icy um, uh, floating ice uh, in their surrounding area, so that they can try to hide themselves by using camouflage. And if you take a look at the body structure of the beluga, and it relatively different to some of the whales like killer whales. What is the difference is that they do not have the dorsal fin on the, uh, at the back of the body, just like other whales. That is one of the way of how beluga actually try to reduce heat loss from that icy environment, that cold um, habitat. So what they do is actually by t as time goes by, like thousand years after thousand years, they try to get rid of the dorsal fin so that they won't have a much more um, surface area in order to to conserve and try to save their heat in the, inside their body. So some of you actually said in order to cope with such cold temperature, they have blubber as well. So now I want you to check out your uh, thumb here and then stick out your thumb and then also stick out your pinky finger here and I want you to really put it onto your tummy and then try to wrap it around your body so what I, am I asking you to do so is that actually the length from your thumb to your pinky finger is actually the thickness of the blubber that the beluga whales have so that is how they conserve heat and try to protect themselves and try to keep energy under their body. So for the beluga whale, which weighs over a thousand kilograms, they need those blubber uh, for conserving their heat in their daily life so that they won't die because of the cold weather. That is so cool. And also for beluga, they actually have a, a uh, the flipper here so that they can swim fast and then they try to locate their prey. So some of you actually say that echolocation is one of the tricks for belugas in order to find food. So I want you to focus on this uh, bumpy hat on the beluga whale and this is called the melon. This melon part is relatively useful for a beluga because it tries to produce sound waves and try to emit them and try, try to locate um, the prey that they need, like fish. So what they do is try to uh, vibrate this part of the body structure and it emit the sound. And sound travels through water and when it hits a prey like a fish, those waves will just bounce back and then reach the melon of the beluga again so that the beluga can calculate or try to locate where those preys are. So it's a very cool superpower that the beluga have in order to survive. So after talking about the beluga, I have a little question for you to think of. So we talked about there's a lot of different kinds of animals. So now let me show you an other animal before we jump into the Q&A session. So here I have, oops, wait a minute. Here I have a picture of a very huge animal here, and it's called the walruses. So I want you to think about what are the adaptations that walruses have in order to survive for 10 seconds time. Teeth, tusk, hat, wool. That is so cool, everybody. So for the walruses, they actually have blubber around them as well. They weigh over a thousand kilograms as the beluga do, and they do have fats in order to conserve heat as well. And other cool fats is that if you take a look at the picture just now, you will see mustards around, and those mustards can actually detect those chemicals around and try to locate and try to find the food like fish as well. And here I have an other 
stay with me. This body structure is Hux, and it is actually from a walrus uh, up north in the Arctic, and it's quite heavy. Um, I would say the weight of it is similar to a computer. And if you take a look at it, it's quite hard, and then it's quite large, and uh, in, it's quite large in length as well. So, um, for this part, it's called a tusk. And what the walrus do with that is actually they try to use their tusk to haul on ice. So when they try to insert their tusk onto the ice, and then they will drag the whole body forward. And this is how the walrus is actually try to stay on land, try to move around and find a mate. So it's quite heavy. And I like this part so much because it's very useful and unique for the walruses too. So maybe we can jump to um, a little bit of Q&A session before we go to threats and conservation message. Okay, so we had a question from uh, Emma. How many pounds does a wal walrus weigh? Oh, um, for the walruses, uh, in kilograms, it will be over a, hundred, a thousand. So um, I have to try to convert it a little bit. So let me check. Um, I think uh, for, um, for the horses and also for um, the beluga, they are actually very, very heavy. And um, they have those blubber within themselves. And oh, I saw the answer already, it's around 3,000 pounds. That's that's a big big animal. Um, what does do the tusks break off the walrus? So that's a question from Harper. Um, for the walruses, they actually have muscle connected to it, and um, they also have some nerves nervous system within this as well. So um, for the walruses, if uh, tusks break off during a fight. They will grow uh, immediately, but at a very, very slow rate. So sometimes when you see the pictures, uh, some walruses will have shorter tusks just because they try to fight off other mates or enemies. And they will definitely grow, but at a very, very slow rate. Right. That's, that's a really good thing to know. Um, how old can a beluga live for? For beluga, they can live up to um, 60 to 70 years old. But for walruses, they can only live until 30 years old. <laughs> that's still pretty, that's still pretty uh, a long life. Um, yeah. How much does a polar bear eat every day? Cool. So um, for polar bear, they do not need to eat every day, but instead they will try to find their prey um, from time to time, I will say for months. So what they do is that they try to walk, they try to walk around and try to search for uh, whale, uh, beluga whale, or even walruses in order to get the fats or the nutrients they have. So they will just find food from months, uh, between months. Right, and this is a question that kind of goes along with that. Randy wants to know, how does a polar bear hunt? So for both polar bear, they have a very uh, great ability to smell and detect um, the movement and also they have very nice eyesight and also um, they can try to detect the smell, the odor everywhere, and they will try to look for um, movement inside water as well. So I have watched a documentary about how polar bear actually hunt and prey on animals. They actually try to uh, go near the, the edge of the ice and what, they will take a look at the chance and they will try to find if there's any white hat like beluga melon and sometimes seals, they will try to go out of the water and try to breathe a little bit. And that is the best time for um, polar bear to pull um, the whole body using their teeth to the land and try to eat it as a prey, as a food. 
And Warren wants to know, maybe this will be the last question before we go on to the next round of questions. How do they have a recorded um, age of the oldest walrus? Um, I don't have the exact number of how old it is, but uh, for scientists who try to investigate or to try to study about them, the the age could up to 70 years old. It's just like, um, yeah, 70 years old is the oldest one. That's cool. That's very cool. Okay, so we'll take some more questions at the end. So I know Nicole needs to is going to talk about um, some more animals and some more adaptations. So um, for the walruses and also for belugers, they really have a lot of adaptations in order to um, try to cope with the situation up north where it is so cold and there's a lot of predators around. And for uh, a lot of indigenous people up north called Inuit uh, communities, they actually depend on those walruses and also beluger as uh, food intake as well. So for uh, indigenous people, we usually connect with them and we usually chat with them about their livelihood up there. And we realized that actually for um, the people up north, it's not easy to buy any fresh food uh, that we saw from the supermarket. So for your record, um, some of our friends actually told us if we, they need to buy a tomato, um, they have to buy it in a very expensive cost. So for example, if we uh, have to buy a tomato up north, it costs five Canadian dollars each and um, it will take an year for them to really get more resources because there's not much sheep uh, running uh, shipping around the goods for them so uh, they have to really wait for the ship to come once a year to get all the things they need and um, for, because of that, so that um, the indigenous people actually going to find a lot of fresh food around them. So some of them actually consume beluga as one of the nutrient source. So what they do is they try to go hunt, go hunting once a year for a few months and then try to take a boat and try to work together and they try to um, harvest uh, some of the beluga well and try to uh, sell it or try to eat it on their own to get the proteins and fats. Um, this is a sustainable actions for them. That means they actually have traditional knowledge uh, transfer from their ancestor to the generation now that how to actually um, get those beluga meat and also the fats to eat. Um, they won't actually get more than enough for um, the whole family so that they try to keep the number stable and try to keep um, the population of the beluga healthy. Yeah. So this is something that we learned from the indigenous people and usually for indigenous people, they're very kind and they usually share a lot of uh, information with us and they usually share a lot of um, uh, their work and also their experience with scientists up north, up north as well. So for scientists up north, we have a dedicated team there and then they will try to communicate with those indigenous people and try to exchange information about um, the population size of the beluga and try to uh, take a look at the samples that they have uh, in the beluga well. So what the scientists and the Inuit people found is that there are actually plastic inside beluga's in, uh, digestive systems. So um, it's very important for us to know about the health problem, the health issues of the beluga, because they are actually part of the food chain in the Arctic, and it is also the food sources for our friends up north too. Besides having um, uh, plastic inside their body, there are actually more threats that is happening in the Arctic. So there is climate change around. Uh, I'm sure that you experienced some degree of climate change before. So I'm from Hong Kong and um, I have been living in Hong Kong uh, 
uh, that means it's a subtropical area for 25 years. And I really do feel the change of climate, uh, climate change uh, in Hong Kong. So I remember when I was small, uh, like six to seven years old, I had my Christmas uh, with the temperature of around 12 and 13 degrees Celsius. But now I've, I heard from my friend that they have to wear short sleeves for the Christmas because it's getting more hotter and hotter. And the temperature is getting hotter and hotter and this caused a very big problem in the Arctic. So if you take a look or if you imagine the whole environment in the Arctic, part of it is actually covered in ice and the ice uh, thickness is usually more than five meters. And you're right, ice is melting. So because of the hot weather, the ice start to melt and the ice uh, thickness is getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And that's why for indigenous people, they try not to go out as much as possible because the thinner the ice it is, it's actually very, very difficult or very dangerous for um, our friends up north to travel on ice and try to find their food and try to communicate with their uh, families and communities. And also for animals, because uh, especially for walruses, because they hugely relay, rely on the ice in order to find their mates and try to escape from predators like uh, killer whales, having a thinner ice layer means that they are prone to um, the protection of the polar bears as well as killer whales. Their number will decrease rapidly and they cannot adapt to the environment uh, rapidly as well. So it's very important for us to really uh, notice and try to focus on climate change. And Moreover, there will be noise pollution everywhere near the Arctic because there are ships like transporting goods from everywhere. So it's time for us, for the scientists to really study about the Arctic, try to study about the animals and try to work with the indigenous people to ensure the safety. So we have mentioned there's plastic problem, we have climate change, and also we have noise pollution in the Arctic. So what we can do in order to help our friends uh, up north and then also uh, for the animals that living near the Arctic. Um, I do have a few recommendations for you guys to consider. So for um, no, by knowing more about the environment in the Arctic and also the animals there, we can see and we can brainstorm a lot of ideas of how to protect them. So um, I know that some of my uh, friends here at OceanWise, they're actually working really hard in trying to uh, promote and try to share a lot of information with the uh, friends and family on the Arctic, as well as for uh, the ocean. So you can try to, by sharing your information, try, try to um, share with your friends and family about the knowledge that you have known from this session or even from YouTube or from different source of uh, information, try to tell them as many as much as you can. And for the plastic pollution that is happening around the world, I strongly, rank, uh, I strongly recommend all of you to really think about your daily life. So do we need a lot of plastic in our daily life? Um, can we get rid of a lot of plastics? So for myself, I usually bring my water bottle and also my utensils for lunch, for meals, as well as I try to bring my own bag to do grocery shopping every day so that I won't use any of the single use plastics. And I try to join some clean up, uh, shoreline cleanup actions near me as well. So not only uh, to the beach, but also I went to some lakes in order to pick up rubbish and pick up plastics and try to recycle them one by one so that we can actually help the environment because you know, uh, for the plastic or for trash, they have the ability or the they have the chance to follow the water current and travel up north as well. So by doing bits and bits, 
I am sure all of us can actually make a great, very great impact and try to do something for our environment. So let us take That's a look. That's beautiful. Time. Those are good actions. And we, um, so Randy and Emma have reusable water bottles. Um, so that really helps. Um, and Gabriel was saying something about plastic, but Emma would like to know, are there narwhals in the Arctic? Sure. So actually for now worse, not only uh, we can we can see them in the Arctic, but also actually we can also see them in Canada as well. So if you know there's a place called St. Lawrence River, there is a subpopulation out there and they're doing really, really great. And I strongly recommend you to really search for them and try to take a look at the videos. And we do have videos about um, the beluga and also the Nile Wars uh, in St. Lawrence River as well. So try to take a look at them. Yes, narwhals are very cool. Yeah. We have some of our friends in Nunavut who have seen a narwhal out in the wild. It's really, really cool. Do you know the nickname? Let's see if the boys and girls know the nickname of the narwhal. What do they call it? Oh, I don't know their nickname. Yeah. But, oh, a sea of um, the unicorn of the sea. Absolutely. Oh, That's awesome. Ooh, that's awesome. For you guys. Yeah, but is that I actually know one word about uh how to uh how to describe the blubber in Beluga in Inuit Kermutis language. So you can follow me with that word as well. So for blubber in Inuit language, it's called muduk. So you can follow me, muduk. Muduk. Yeah, so this is how the Inuit people actually communicate uh, in terms of the blubber in beluga whale. Hmm. That's awesome. So thank you so much, Nicole. It was a great day. You started off our, us off at the beginning learning about all the tiny animals in the in the oceans and today we've learned about the arctic animals and the adaptations that they need to survive and um, i know that you have a lot more sessions coming up uh tomorrow uh, we have sessions not with nicole but tomorrow we have a session with um sharks for uh, the moat marine museum in um florida and drawing sharks with Colleen oh. and learning about kaboom science in the first thing in the morning and discovering dinosaurs in the afternoon, just before dinner time, and a coding one at um, in at late afternoon. So we've got a busy day, but we're calling it Shark Day tomorrow because we've got two shark sessions. And I know we have some real scientists who are excited about sharks. So I want to thank you so much, Nicole, for a great day. Thank you so much to our friends who came in from all over Canada. And we'll see you tomorrow. And make sure you try to uh, take a look at the education uh, education.ocean.org, just like this um, website. And then you can click on it, and then you can try to see some of the information before the shock day. <laughs> we will. We'll try that for sure. We're going to try and get those resources up on our website. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you later.